Good hope everyone's had a good afternoon today. To go and read the mother of the Lord has given us. Our lesson this evening, looking at the reality of repentance. There are numerous occasions throughout the Bible where you find individuals involved in sin, repenting of it, and being restored uh, to God and, and having the ability to be forgiven of their sins. And he also, among those numerous times in which we see that, we also find a few occasions where you can tell it most definitely is a very difficult time of repentance because of the actions that are involved. Maybe perhaps we think about David and Bathsheba and, and the death of the child that was born as a result of David and Bathsheba coming together. But we also have another example of what we might call a very gut riching occasion in Ezra chapter 9 and chapter 10. And so this evening I want to show the reality of sin and how it makes life so much more painful than it has to be. Ezra records one of the most painful examples of sin and repentance in the Bible, sin that affects families, that affected the husband and the wife and that affects the children as well. As you look at Ezra chapters 9 and chapter 10, we're not going to be looking at every single verse of Ezra chapter 9 and chapter 10, but we'll be looking at the sin that took place and the requirement of repentance that would follow. And we'll begin by looking at Ezra chapter 9, looking at the reason for repentance. The reason for repentance. Ezra chapter 9, going through here, through verses 1 uh, through 5 of Ezra chapter 9. We first begin by looking at, as we look at this section, the reason for repentance, we look at the sin requiring repentance in Ezra chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. For the Bible says, when, the, when these things were done, the leaders came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with respect to the abominations of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, as the holy seed is mixed with the peoples of the land. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and the rulers have been foremost in this trespass. You'll notice here in verses 1 and verses 2 the sin that takes place. The Bible says they have not separated themselves there in verse 1 from the peoples of the land. The peoples of the land were known to be those who were idolatrous in nature, and God, we're going to see here in a moment, in a few moments, they are reminded of God's command for them not to take for themselves wives from among these people. But also notice here the latter part of verse 2. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and rulers has been foremost in this trespass. That means the leaders have had a big part in this sin. They were not simply ones who this is brought to their attention. Now the Bible says that they were what? They were involved in. Their, their rulers have been foremost in this trespass, which also, as we understand, means sin. The people have not separated themselves from the people of the land. They have married people of the land against God's command. We find in the very next verses, verses 3 and 4, the immediate response to this in verses 3 and 4. Notice verse 3, so when I heard this thing, Ezra says, I tore my garments and my robe and plucked out some of the hair of my head and beard and sat down astonished. And that might sound like an odd reaction to what he's saying. Not today we have someone say, well, I just pulled my hair out because of the stress. Well, Ezra, Bible says, he certainly did, pull out a few of those things because of what was taking place. You look at the latter part, and you look at the latter part of verse 2. What had happened? The hand of the leaders and rulers have been foremost in this trespass. The sin was awful enough, and the fact that the leaders and the rulers had had a hand in as well is not helping at all. The Bible says there in verse 3 of Ezra chapter 9 that he sat down astonished. Astonished at what? Their sin? You might say the boldness of their sin. Verse 4 says, And everyone who had trembled at the words of the, of the God of Israel simple to me, because the transgression of those who had been carried away captive, and said astonished until the evening sacrifice. And so what happened? They were coming together to, to Ezra, and they're trembling because of the words of God. 
Why? Because what God has said concerns their transgression or their sin of those who have been carried away captive, that those who have been carried away captive are those who have done this sin. He says, and I said, astonished until the evening sacrifice, which gives us the idea. He sat there and just complete must a shock and amazement for a time, thinking about what had taken place. The people came trembling in fear because of the words of God that came because of this sin. We also notice the very next verse, uh, verse 5, over the third priest, First part of this. He says, At the evening sacrifice, he says, I arose for my fasting. The the King James says he arose there from he rose up the idea of showing his heaviness from the sin. He rose up because he'd been sitting for so long thinking about what has taken place. You know, we all sometimes sit down contemplating maybe something has taken place, maybe a loss of a loved one, some event has transpired that we don't know yet how to respond to it. And that's what Ezra is doing. He goes, he just sits down, he, and he just is grieving until the evening. Thinking about all these things that have taken place. Because with this sin comes a tremendous consequence. We find next the reality of repentance in verses 5 and following. We will finally recognizing the fault in verse 5 and 6. Here the Bible says, And the evening sacrifice I rose in my fasting, and having torn my garments and my robe, he says, I fell on my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. Showing what? He's calling out to God. He's praying to God. Young nations like to use this idea a lot when talking about praying to God, lifting their hands and those types of things. It's not a simple thing to do, but it is done out of some pretense or for some selfish reason. Here in verse 5, it's not that he's trying to gain attention for himself. He's calling out to God in prayer because of his tremendous sin had taken place. He says he fell on his knees and spread out his hands to the Lord my God. Verse 6, the Bible says, And I said, Oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift up my face to you. He is ashamed, he said, and humiliated. You ever done something if you haven't? When you get older, you'll find probably as young as you'll realize simply you've done something or you'll do something that you are not proud of. And Ezra here, remember, this is a grown man. He says he was ashamed and humiliated. He was too ashamed, he said, and humiliated to lift up his face. He says to you, my God. Why do you feel that way? The Bible says, for our iniquities have risen higher that our heads and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. He was completely ashamed, humiliated, and astonished at what had taken place. A massive public sin, as we're going to find in Ezra chapter 10, the Bible actually reveals their names are actually recorded, all those who were guilty. Publicly recorded for us today. He was Humiliated, he was ashamed, he was astonished. If you go back to, to verses one and two, and now here in verse five, he says he was so ashamed, astonished, humiliated, he did, did not lift up his face to God because their sins were so grievous. As he says they have risen higher than our heads. Verses five and six. Well, if you think about recognizing his fault, Ezra also points out something else as we move along, thinking about. Recognizing the fault. We look down Ezra chapter 9, dropping down to verse 13. And he says, And after all that, that come, has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, since you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve. Did you catch that? Less than we deserve. He's saying, God has been lenient to us. He says, We deserve a whole lot more than this. You have punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and have given us such deliverance as this. Should we again break the commandments and join in marriage of the people committing these abominations? The abomination wasn't just, wasn't just marrying the people, but also the people whom they were marrying were those also committing abominations. They were not good people. God wasn't saying, do not marry them because they look different. He's saying, don't marry them because they are wicked people. We stay away from them. 
He said there in verse 14, he says, We do not be angry with us until you have consumed us, and there will be no remnant or survivor. O Lord God of Israel, verse 15, he says, You are righteous, for we are left as a remnant. As it is, as it is this day, here we are before you in our guilt, though no one can stand before you because of this. They're not going to stand before God because of their guilt and their humiliation because of their actions. He's saying that, basically what he's saying here in verses 13 through 15 is we deserve to be completely destroyed and have nothing left of us to be, to be no remnant at all because we have broken your commandment, the commandment of God, who have done what? Brought them out of Egypt and brought them out of bondage and all, done all these things for them. What do they do? He says here in verse 13 through 15, we have broken your law. He says, what happened if we did it again? Would you not just destroy us all, right there in verse 14? He says, would you not be angry with us until you have consumed us, there would be no remnant or survivor? He's indicating that's what they deserve, right? They should just be none of them left because all the wicked things they have done. He is recognizing his fault, but also showing God's grace and leniency. As we saw back there in verse 13, when he says that God has punished them less than their iniquities deserve. They are recognizing the fault, thinking about the reality of repentance, but also we find they endure the pain, the guilt, and also, as we saw earlier in verses 5 and 6, the humiliation of their sin. We find, we back up now to Ezra chapter 10, uh, move forward rather, to Ezra chapter 10, that while Ezra was praying and weeping, as we saw back in chapter 9, verses 5 and following, then the people came to him weeping over, over their sin in Ezra 10, verses 1 and 2. While Ezra was praying, while he was confessing, weeping, and bowing down before the house of God, what was he doing? He was trying to what? He's asking for forgiveness. The Bible says there he was praying, confessing, weeping, and bowing down before the house of God. It seems he had no idea a very large group of people were coming up to him because he was busy praying to God. Because we back in chapter 9, he was humiliated, he was ashamed, he was astonished. He said he couldn't lift his eyes to God. And then when they come upon him here in, here in chapter 10, verse 1, they find as they're praying and confessing and weeping and bowing down for the house of God. And a very large assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him from Israel. For the people wept very bitterly. Did you ever hear the phrase, ugly cry? You know what that means? When you're crying so much, it's, it's not pretty. So you have sometimes those occasions where you kind of get teared up or you weep. And then you have those occasions where you just say uncontrollable sobbing. When I think of that very bitter weeping, that's probably what they're doing. That ugly cry which no one looks at one another because it's not pleasant. It's not just shedding a tear. They were crying their eyes out, so to speak, because of their sin that God was bringing out before them. They wept, the Bible says, very bitterly. We find, as we continue reading there in verse 2, one of the men speaks up and says to Edward there in verse 2, We have trespassed, we have trespassed other against our God. Now have taken pagan wives from the peoples of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel in spite of this. They're saying, We have sinned against God, but yet God, as Ezra said earlier in chapter 9, has not punished them as what, what they should have been punished or could have been punished. He said God was lenient. In chapter 10, he says, we find here in verses 1 and 2, that what, what has happened is God's leniency, is God's mercy. There remains a remnant of people still remaining. He says, yet now there is hope in Israel in spite of this. Their sin wasn't overlooked. God was going to save a remnant, preserve a remnant, and still punish people for their sins. They were not going to get off scot free, so to speak. Their sin had to cease before true repentance and forgiveness could take place. We look at verses 3 through 5 here. Look, look what happens in Ezra chapter 10. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and those that have been born to them. What did he just say? Well, let me ask you this. You ever heard someone say, well, they should have divorced because you know, there's children involved. 
We go to the emotional side of things. Well, there's children involved. It's funny because, it's not funny, but here in Ezra chapter 10, you have that exact situation. What does Ezra tell them to do? What does God tell them to do through Ezra? Look at verse, verse 3. The people say, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and those that have been born, children, to them, according to the advice of my master, and of those who tremble the commandment of our God. And let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter is your responsibility. We are also, we also are with you. Be of your good courage and do it. Then Ezra arose and made the leaders of the priests, the Levites, and all Israel swear an oath that swear swear an oath that they would do according to these to this word. So they swore an oath. They would do what? What was necessary for repentance? What was necessary to have their sins forgiven? Was that an easy thing to do? Absolutely not. There had to be a horrible and dark time in their life. They had sin that could not be ignored. And we find in verses 3 through 5, they make a promise. The people themselves they make a promise to God that they will do what? Put away their lives, the children who are born of them. Because why? Because if they do not do that, God says they have sinned against him. Those things should never have taken place. We continue reading, we find in verse 6 that Ezra mourns over the guilt and the sin of the people. In Ezra 10, the latter part of verse 6, the Bible says, He ate no bread and, and, and drank no water, for he mourned because of the guilt of those from the captivity. He mourned over their sin. Those that had just said, We have to make this promise to God, make this agreement with God, and we'll put away our wives. And those who were born to them, their children, because until they did so, they were guilty of sin. The humiliation we find in chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, here in just a moment, told their sin by Ezra, and they're, they're told their sin by Ezra, and the people respond accordingly in Ezra 10, verses 11 and 12. Here the Bible says, Now therefore make confession to the Lord God of your fathers, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the pagan wives. God told them to do what? Put them away. <clears throat> if you look at it this way, they had committed fornication, not with their wives, but with God. They had been unfaithful to God. God gave the command, they disobeyed, and God told, told them to put, put them away. Because they had disobeyed his command. He found in verse 11, Now therefore make confession to the Lord God of your fathers, and do what? <laughs> do his will. Right? Separate yourselves from the people's land. Why? Because they're wicked. That's why. And from the pagan wives. Then all the assembly answered and said with a loud voice, Yes, as you have said, so we must do. Not might do, not will consider it. And some would say today, well, we want to maintain a sense of ethics, so we're going to stay with our um, with our pagan wives and our children. There is never virtue in sin. There's never grace in sin. If you disobey God, if they were to disobey God here, they would be punished. Any leniency you might say could be quickly removed. But instead they respond in verse 12, as you have said, so we must do. Their sin was public to all. If you drop down to the end of chapter 10, but even their names are recorded here. If you look, continue reading through chapter 10, you begin to find a list of names. All the way down until you get to the final verse in verse 44. You know what the list of names are? You know what that is? They're guilty. <clears throat> Those who have transgressed God's command. You look at verse 44 of Ezra 10. All these, all these reference to those whose names are mentioned prior to verse 44. It was public, their sin was public, and they were what? Well, they were listed here even for us still today. All these have taken pagan wives, and some of them had wives by whom they had children. That was a horrible, horrible time. The only way they could come out of that was through honest and sincere repentance. Some lessons for us today. 
Repentance can be painful. Ezra is shown in these chapters as weeping, trembling, and praying because of the sin and guilt of the people. He was shown as a man who what? Who was trembling literally before God. He was weeping because of their sin. He was praying because of their sin. He had guilt because of their sin. But as we look into the New Testament, others trembled when they realized they were in error. You think about Saul, who we would know to become Paul, Acts 9, verse 6. When he met Christ in the road to Damascus, the Bible tells us there in verse 6, so he, that is Paul, or excuse me, Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Why was he trembling? Because he was in the wrong. He was in the wrong. He laid there, the Bible tells us he fell back. He was astonished. He trembled. Why? Because Saul was in sin. And he knew at that moment he was in sin, and there was no escape from it at that moment. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Repentance can be painful. But godly sorrow brings a desire to be forgiven. These people in Ezra's time wanted to be forgiven, as we find in Ezra chapter 10 and verse 12, and all they simply said with a loud voice, Yes, as you have said, so we must do. You find that actually what happens, you continue reading, there are so many of them, they actually set up a little a little process for doing it. They actually sat down and talked and investigated each and every person who was involved in it, and those who were guilty had to what? Make it right. And then their names were listed still for us to look at today. But they had decided they were going to do what had to be done. Verse 12, as you have said, so we must do. Godly sorrow is a painful thing, but the forgiveness that results is absolutely necessary. Look at, first, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. Godly sorrow does what? It produces repentance. For those people sorry they have sinned against God, I don't think there's any doubt. They were petrified. Ezra himself said, The Lord has not punished us like we, what we deserve. We continue reading in Ezra 9, chapter 10 as well. That the idea was very clear. That Ezra thought we shouldn't even be here today. They were deserving to die, what they had done. Godly sorrow can be a painful thing, but it does bring forgiveness when we allow that godly sorrow to push us to repentance. We can learn from the events in Ezra's time that sin must be repented of, no matter how painful it may be. Sin is always painful, isn't it? Whether it's something we confess to God privately, something we confess to someone else, or something that's public we have to deal with ourselves publicly, it's always painful. But friends, there's something far worse that awaits us. We, we, we just stop and not repent. There's something far worse than the humiliation we've been faced in this life. In Ezra 10, verse 44, what painful thing they had to do? They had to put away those pagan wives. They had to put them behind because why? First of all, they were wicked people. That's why God told them in the first place to stay away from them. But even not even more importantly, God told them, do not intermarry with them, and they disobeyed. And they had to repent. So let us learn from these people and come to God desiring forgiveness, no matter how painful and difficult it might be. The Bible tells us we must do in order to have heaven as our home. The Bible reveals we must hear the word of God. Upon hearing it, we must believe in Christ, the Son of God. Upon that belief, we must repent of our sins and confess that Christ is God's Son. And then we must be immersed in baptism and remain faithful to God. We find that throughout the New Testament. We also know that as Christians, sometimes we make mistakes. As we remind in 1 John 1 and verse 9, we must repent of those things, pray to God that He is just and faithful to give us of our sins, and He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. <laughs> This evening, as you think about these things, we can help you and encourage you in any way. You can come forward now. Should we stand and sing the song that's been selected?